the train is running by here at the old Quinn City Podcast Network. And uh, lots of fun things happening at Man Listening, or at least to the man in Man Listening. You probably remember when I went to California in December to talk to Marina Zinovich, who was on the podcast. Well, I can tell you her documentary series is coming out on HBO Max, and yours truly is in it. And they've got an air date. It's September 30th, and I can now tell you, I was bursting at the seams, this documentary series is about remnant fellowship in Nashville, Tennessee. And it's really, really interesting. I think you'll like it. And the other thing is, uh, Man Listening is going to record live as part of the Queen City Podcast Festival, which is part of Charlotte Shout. And we have a date for that. We have a special guest, which I'm not going to announce, but on Monday, September 20th at 11 a.m. down in Spirit Square. Is that right, Liz? Down in Spirit Square. Liz is giving me the thumbs up. Man Listening is going to record live. So if you want to come by at 11 a.m. that morning, which is fun. This is all fun stuff. And one last little note, since good things come in threes, is that uh, my children's book, the first ever, which is called Sophia Loves Tortillas. It's so sweet. The illustrator, Liza Donovan, who we need to have on the podcast, she's almost finished with the drawings. And I'm so excited. I hope to have that out before Christmas. So lots of fun things happening. Thank you guys for sticking around. And it didn't matter who you were or where you came from as long as I didn't treat you differently. What is the sound of one man listening? This is Man Listening, a fresh podcast featuring the stories of strong women who bounce back. Man Listening, because every woman deserves to be heard. Hi, I'm Stuart Watson and welcome to Man Listening. I really, for years now, have always wanted to sit down and understand the history and the background of a woman named Shirley Fulton. Shirley Fulton was the first black woman to be a judge, a Superior Court judge, in the entire state of North Carolina. And when I was a reporter, I really, really respected her. She had this even temperament about her, uh, what they call judicial temperament. But then I found out uh, that she came from the low country of South Carolina, that she was um, part of a lineage of, of people called the Geechee Gullah people, and that in college, fellow black people called her, you know, Geechee, called her Geechee girl, and that was not a good thing. Uh, it, was, it was a way of saying you were kind of, uh, you didn't speak like you were, you know, an educated person. You didn't, you didn't fit in. And then she told me that as a little girl, uh, she had an experience that most of us can't conceive of in this day and age of mechanized farming. And that is she picked cotton as a little girl. Um, that you didn't have to be uh, a slave uh, to pick cotton. There are white people who pick cotton. There are sharecroppers who pick cotton. And it's just a fascinating story. So, Shirley Fulton. Where were you born? I was born in King Street, South Carolina. That's Ho Williamsburg County. Hospital or home? Hospital. That's when they had separate hospitals. I was born in the Colored Hospital. What was the name of it? Williamsburg Colored Hospital. Is Williamsburg the low country? It is the low country. Okay. So, your people, was there any Ichigala in your people? Yeah, there is. <laughs> have you done any kind of like ancestry or family history? I have not done that. That's in my bucket list to do. For your mother, you're number what of how many? I am number two. Okay, of yeah. two? Of five. Of five. Yeah. 
My oldest brother is deceased, so I'm actually the oldest living child. And what was the age range between the older one and... I am 69. My oldest brother was two years older. And my brother, next brother was two years younger. Then there was a gap. And the next child was about six years younger. Did and you then have to look after the little ones? Yes. You did? And that was part of my responsibility. And how did you respond to that? You know, as a young child, I was excited about it because, you know, you get to hold a baby and do things with them that you <laughs> wouldn't, you don't really know what you're doing, but you're doing what as best you can. So you didn't resent that? I didn't. I didn't. Yeah. And what was your home like? Did you grow up there in the same county? I grew up in King Street um, in the country on a farm. We had tobacco, cotton, corn, uh, animals, pigs, horses. Um, well, they were actually mules, cucumbers, and then soybeans. Did you ever have to pick cotton yourself. Absolutely. You did? I did, I picked cotton, and you know how you have to get the grass out of them? I do not know that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I picked cotton, um, and there was one day every year that me and my two brothers had to miss school because we had to pick cotton. Oh my word. Mm -hmm. And did the school understand? Yeah, because everybody did it. I mean, they did it at different times, but it was a rural area and many farms, so we would take one day to pick cotton, and my mother and her other family members would pick cotton. And I do remember that, um, this is hard to believe, but for 100 pounds of cotton, if they were working for someone else, it was three dollars, a hundred pounds. That's so much work. It is, and That's it's hard work too. So how old were you when you started doing that? I did it forever, from the time, I mean, when I, I was born into it, so. But I mean, as, how old would you have to be as a child to do this? Seven, eight. Oh my word. I mean, you had a smaller, we used to have um, burlap sacks that right. you would pick and put the cotton in to um, take it to the place where it's going to be dumped and you go back and get some more. And we had smaller sacks that the younger kids would be given and the larger sacks for the older. And then there was the sheets, they were called sheets, but they were burlap sheets where people would go at the end of their day well, not at the end of the day, but every time their sack got full of cotton, they would take them and dump them on the sheet. And at the end of the day, we would gather all the sheets up and tie them up, and then they would be weighed to see how much um, cotton you picked in a day. So what time in the morning did you start? Before the break of day. So it was still, the sun wasn't up. No. It was twilight. Twilight. Who taught you how to do this? No one taught you. You just saw other people doing it and you learned from that. And if you made a mistake, someone would correct you along the way. Did you cut your hands? Yes. The pods were pretty sharp. They had, they're like a burr. Yeah. That's amazing. It's almost like thorns. They are like thorns. Yeah. Because, you know, it's, they grow up. And then they have all these little edges to them. And yeah. And how did you know how to avoid, like, snakes, et cetera? Oh, that was, didn't know how to avoid them, but just to be careful that you didn't step on one or one got to you before. Because they were there, and it was just a fact of life that you had to live with. Rattlesnakes. All kinds of snakes. All kinds of snakes. Yeah, I remember one day I was going to pick some berries, blueberries, because blueberries grew along the roads, and a snake was crossing the road, and I didn't see him, and I stepped on it accidentally. And I 
absolutely screamed. The snake was getting away when I was standing there so screaming. So it didn't bite you? It didn't bite me, because mm -mm, I was jumping and screaming. Oh, my <laughs> word. Oh, my word. So it teaches you to pay attention. Yes, at least to the ground as you're walking. Now, so you go out there before dawn and you have your little sack as just a little girl. Yeah. Um, I, I have to conjure an image. What were you wearing? Did you wear a little dress or would you wear pants? No dresses. No dresses. Yeah, you wore pants and something that's going to cover your arm. So right. A shirt that's going to cover your arm as because. much because of the sun. Right. Yeah. And you don't want to get baked while you're out there. Right. And then a hat? Yeah, we had the sun hat. People wear them for different reasons now, but we would have a sun hat to sh keep the shade over our face and neck and back. So broad brimmed straw? Absolutely. Yeah. And then you would begin up one of these long rows, right? Yeah. Yes. And that was yours? That was mine. If I got behind because I was slower than the others, someone would move over and help me catch up. Um, did anybody yell at you if you were behind? No. No? No. It was just a family kind of a thing. Yeah. You know, we're out there and you, everybody has to get it done, so we did it as best we could together. I mean, there were those who wanted to show off, so they would run away and continue um, ahead of the rest of the group. Was there kind of a competition? Somewhat. Um, Somewhat to see who could pick the most cotton. But you, did you get anything special if you picked more? No, not no. that I recall. Not really. And no. nobody paid you. Nobody paid me directly. Right. But my mother would get credit for what I did. I get you. Mm -hmm. And did she ever share any of that? Did you ever get an allowance or anything? Yeah, it wasn't much of an allowance, but we got an allowance uh, for working in the fields and picking cotton and helping with the tobacco. And um, Did you talk to one another when you were in the field? Mm -hmm. We did. And so you would just visit or chat or that kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you talk about what's going on, like you talk in an office, except it wasn't a, that kind of setting. Yeah. What's going on in your life, who's done what in the community, and things like that. And so people wouldn't just work silently, they would visit to kind of oh, pass no. the time. Yeah, everybody had something to say. Yeah. Now I have to ask a super stupid question. Did anyone ever sing? Sometimes. I mean, people who knew how to sing and some who didn't know how to sing mm -hmm. would sing. Did you go to church as a little girl? I did. What church did you go to? I went to a Baptist church. It was Midway Baptist Church, and I lived next door to the church because my grandparents lived on one side, and we lived on the other side. And my grandparents donated the land for the church. So we were very committed to that church, and every time the church door opened, we as the kids had to be there. Um, how is it that your parents came, grandparents, I mean, we're talking turn of the century, mm -hmm. how did they come to own land? Their um, parents, that's how it, as far back as I go, but it had to come from freedom as slaves wow. to my, probably my great, great, great grandparents. And so did they earn the money to purchase the land or was it deeded to them or how, how did they? A small portion was deeded to them and then they purchased some more. Who deeded it to them? I guess their owners, I don't know who deeded it. Wow. Mm -hmm. Their owners gave them a small plot of land? Yeah. Wow. Do you know what family that was? I do not. But there were lots of Fultons mm -hmm. in my hometown. 
So I suspect it was somebody by the name of Fulton. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but you haven't done any of the I have not. or anything yeah. like that. No. Yeah. Have you done the little spit in the tube where you see uh, various ethnicities? No. You ever? No. Uh, that's <laughs> fascinating. Does, does it conf <laughs> do, do, Some people don't like that because of the privacy issue. Yeah. And some people are just absolutely fascinated by it. We were not. Yeah. <laughs> I get it. I understand. What should I know about your mother and father to really understand you? My parents had the same last name, and they were distantly related to each other, and lots of that happened during that era. Neither of my parents went to college. My mother went graduated high school. My father did not. He was a laborer all of his life and my mother worked on a farm. My mother and my siblings, my two older brothers, my brothers, one older, one younger, worked on the farm um, primarily while my dad went out and found another job. They were poor. They owned land, and they used that land to farm. Did you ever go without food? No. Clothing? No. Or shelter? Did you always? Always had shelter. I guess the community built homes. And sometimes I remember my parents building a home during my last year of high school. And they hired, a, I guess it was a contractor, someone to come in and build that home. The home that you grew up in, though, up to that point, had the family and the community built that home? The family and community built that home, and it was a more of a shotgun type home. Uh, there were two bedrooms, kitchen, uh, living room, and uh, during that time, when I was born and up until I was about junior high school, there were no bathrooms. There were no indoor bathrooms. So there was a privy or an outhouse, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And so in the middle of the night, if you had to go to the bathroom. You had to use a pot that was kept inside the house and someone would be responsible for taking it out the next morning. Were you ever responsible for that? I think I was, but I don't have any real clear memory of it. So the chores would rotate through the kids? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, did your mother teach you how to cook? Yes, that was one of my responsibilities. What is something she cooked that you love to cook to this day? She made the best mac and cheese. <laughs> <laughs> and what's the secret? Um, I would change it up a bit. And I use um, sour cream. I don't use milk. And sour cream, eggs, cheese, and... I use different types of cheese to make it. Like what kind? Um, cheddar, sharp, medium, mild. And then there was a couple of others that I use. Sometimes I put in Gouda cheese. Uh, that sounds wonderful. <laughs> that sounds good. But she made lots of vegetables because we grew vegetables. Did um, she ever make biscuits? Yeah, that's something I never could perfect. <laughs> But she would make biscuits every day. That was our staple, staple for making it through the day. Yeah, and so the produce that you all would have for dinner or whatever, did that come from the farm? Was most of what you ate came, came from? from the farm, yeah. We had um, plum trees, grapes. Um, we didn't have bananas, but apples. Yeah. You know, wow. pomegranates. Pomegranate? Mm -hmm. That's kind of an exotic fruit. Oh, it's around Charlotte. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you said you were poor. Were you conscious as a little girl, we're poor? No, not in those terms. I mean, we had food to eat. We had uh, clothes to wear. It wasn't always what I wanted to wear, but... I would have desired if it was my druthers. I would have desired more, but 
I would manage to make it with what we had. Was there some point at which you realized, or how, what age did you realize, boy, some people have a lot more than we do? I think I always knew that. Part of my dream, as I worked in the cotton fields and helped gather the tobacco, was I don't want to live like this. I don't want to live on a farm. And because it was hard work, but I didn't like the work that I was doing. So my dream was to go to college because I figured college was the answer to get away from there. And where did you get that idea? I just read and saw pictures and, um, you know, my teachers, some of them were relatives, and we would talk about college. So you said there was a, um, a black hospital and a white hospital. Yes. Was there a black school and a white school? Yes. Um, so during the time you went to high school, was that school integrated at any point? No. It well, wasn't? The last year of my high school, we had the option of integrating. And that was in 1968. Because, you know, South Carolina always did things a little slower than the rest of the country, at least some parts of the country. And, and did you want to go to another school? No, I was happy where I was. I didn't know anything else, though. Is there a particular teacher in your school that was impactful to you? Yeah, I had several teachers who were impactful, but my science and um, chemistry teacher, not that I like science and chemistry, but I liked the teacher. <laughs> and she was very impactful because she lived with some relatives of mine. And she would pick me up sometimes and take me to school and um, or take me to other places that I wouldn't have had the opportunity to go. And she encouraged you to go beyond high school? To go Absolutely, to yes. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you ever go back to a reunion, um, or if you ever go back home, mm -hmm. people would say, I remember Shirley, she was what? What type of student? They would probably say, I remember Shirley, she was smart. And they would say that because I graduated when I was 16. Oh. I was ahead of my normal grade. Is that because you uh, tested out, like skipped a grade by... T I skipped a grade, but we weren't testing during that time. I grew up in the, in the country and there was a country school before we transferred over to the state school. Uh, it was a two-room school. Actually, there were three rooms because there was a place for them to cook the meals. And there were two teachers. And the classes went from one to six. So one teacher did first, second, and third. And the other teacher did fourth, fifth, and sixth. And I, my parents had moved to D.C. for a short period of time, and then they came back because my granddad died and my, de my father was the only male. When we came back, I started kindergarten in D.C. Came back, there was no kindergarten in South Carolina. So I went to first grade, and things weren't as strict about age during that time. So I probably should not have gone, but because I'd already started school, they permitted me to come to school. So I started early, and then I was in a class where there were three grades, and I would follow my teacher from one grade to the next and participate in the class that she was teaching in the next one. So at the end of that year, I was skipped a grade. Later, as I grew older, I realized that things were a little different for me because I was younger and I didn't, I couldn't do the things that other kids who were older than me were able to do because I was too young to do it. And I guess it became even more 
apparent to me when I went to college because I went to college at 16 and many places that the kids hung out, you had to be 18, you know, especially if they were serving beer and um, I couldn't go. Um, did your mother encourage, discourage, or was she neutral about you leaving home and going to My mother did not want me to leave home. She could use the help. Yeah, she could use the help, but I think there was also the fear of going into the unknown, somewhere she had never gone, and people who were close to her had never gone. So here I was, 16 years old, determined I'm leaving home, I'm going in this unknown land. So you were a teenager who all of a sudden was gonna be with adults. They would be young adults, but they would be of age. Yeah. And lots of things could happen. Yeah. Yeah. So she was less concerned about the family than she was concerned for you. Yeah. Yeah, for me, but my mother didn't want any of us to leave home. I mean, she would have been happy if we had all stayed around and bought a mobile home and lived on the land. But she also never forbade you? Right? No, she didn't forbid me to go. And I had a mentor who was uh, encouraging me and her and sort of smoothing the way for me to go. As a matter of fact, he drove us, to co me and my parents, to my college. And so that how did you decide where to go? I just looked in the book and read about the schools. And I the wanted, book? What? There was, you know, in the guidance counselor's office, oh, there was the a mm -hmm, book that told you about different schools. And I chose A&T once because I wanted to be far enough that my parents wouldn't expect me to come home every weekend. And now remind me where A&T is? Winsboro. Oh, okay. Not that far, but they weren't going to. Oh, North Carolina. A North Carolina, yeah. Oh, so you were leaving the state. Yeah. I mean, you say not that far. Well, not in looking back now. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess it would have put a little fear into parents, a parent's mind to have a 16-year-old taken off to go to some unknown land that they had never visited and didn't know a lot about. Why did you decide A&T? Well, I thought it was a good school and it offered some of the things that I wanted to do. And it was far enough that I didn't have to go home every weekend and because I wanted to be free and... Could you have gone to uh, Clemson or the University of South Carolina? Mm -hmm. You could have. I could have. And a lot of my classmates went to schools in South Carolina. And what was the money situation in going to those schools? Would you have gotten scholarships? Or? Yeah, I imagine I would have gotten the same thing I got by going to A&T. Which was probably not a full ride. You probably had to work. I worked and um, work study. When you left home at 16 and you think, I get this degree, what did you imagine yourself doing I didn't know. I just know that I wanted to go to college. And I thought about being a teacher, but I wasn't really big on teaching. So I think I wrote in my yearbook, the year I graduated, that I wanted to be a business administrator. And I wasn't sure what that was or what <laughs> they did. But it was not picking cotton. It was not picking cotton. <laughs> And it was not farming. <laughs> the world of not farming. <laughs> That's the Made world you all the difference. The history books that you were issued in high school, mm -hmm. um, were they all about white people? Absolutely. <laughs> I don't know that there were any that, there were none in the school uh, that were not by white people. And they didn't teach you anything about my history or anybody that was different. Than that. So to learn about the history of the Geechee Gullah people, how did you find out anything about those people? I actually lived in Charleston one summer with my 
uh, aunt and uncle who was a brother of my mother and her wife and kids. So I went there and spent the summer so I got to go to the market and to hear them talk. And there's a lot of that language, the dialect in my hometown. If you hear people talk there, you would say they're Geechee because I was called a Geechee when I went to college. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. And was that a good thing, bad thing? Was it? Well, it was a bad thing for me then because I didn't know any better. Um, did they mean it bad? Yeah. They did? Yeah. Yeah, that you can't talk properly. So these are other black people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, is that once you open your mouth, or was it based on appearance or No, skin it was tone? when I opened my mouth ah. and talked, and my um, dialect was sometimes different. My brother, my younger brother, was probably his dialect was a lot different and he went through a lot trying to fit in wow mm -hmm. um did your parents or your teachers encourage you to kind of clean up your language or learn to speak differently no mm -mm. um on the contrary did was there anybody that was there that was trying to preserve words or stories or means of speaking no, and I wish they had, but no one tried to do that. I go back now, and when I go to places like Buford, South Carolina, I see all the color that they have preserved, and not so much that we, as the black people, have done it, but the white people have done it. And they have the books and the, uh, all of the things that colored people did during that time. And Charleston used to do it, but they have changed. And they, I mean, the market there, but it's not um, the Gullah people anymore. So, uh, where'd you first get the idea of law school? Went to A&T, as you know. I dropped out after my third year. Um, I got married, uh, went to work in the Register of Deeds office. And that was the first time I met lawyers working in that office. And I got to talk to them to learn a little bit about what they did and how they did it because they came into the Register of Deeds office to search real estate titles and birth certificates and death certificates, things like that. I decided, and then, you know, they carried nice briefcases, so I decided I want to be a lawyer. And from there, I went back to A&T and got my undergraduate degree and was off to law school. And then how'd you pick a law school? That was tough, whether to go to an all-black school or to a white. So I started at North Carolina Central um, because I, I wanted to be in an uh, HBCU. And after my first year, I decided I wanted to transfer over to Duke, and I did. Because? Because I thought it would present, give me better opportunities, being an all-white school with a decent reputation. When you went to Duke, mm -hmm. it would have been the first school you ever went to where there were a lot of white people. Yes. And what was that like? It was a different kind of educational setting. There wasn't the encouragement. There were 10 students, African-American students, in the law school when I started. When I ended, there were 10 students. So the number didn't increase. However many graduated was the number that was admitted. Encouragement was for corporate. And those were the kinds of entities that were brought onto campus for you to interview with at the end of your year. And if you didn't want to be corporate, then there wasn't anything for you. Yeah. So I went, I started out with a small firm. And by the time I graduated from law school, I was a single parent, single mom. 
and I wanted to be in a setting where I could be a mom, but also make enough money to support us. So one of my law professors called me, and I was pretty close to her, and she knew what my goal was, and she asked me to come to Charlotte and interview with Peter Gilchrist, because Peter had gone to Duke, and he would called there asking for an African-American woman for his office, and she called me and asked me if I'd go interview with him. And I did. I came to interview. That wasn't where I wanted to be, and I made up my mind before I left Durham that I wasn't going to take that job, because I don't want to be a prosecutor. <laughs> so um, I came uh, out of respect and... Um, and how did you get over here? Did you drive? Or I drove. Uh, what kind of car did you have? I had a, um, what year was that? It was a Toyota Corona, red. <laughs> and I drove to Charlotte and interviewed with Peter, and I was taking the place, I was going to be replacing Calvin Murphy, who is an African-American male. and. Peter asked me when I went into the interview, he said, where do you see yourself 10 years from now? And I hadn't thought 10 years down the road. I was like, huh, I'm try I was thinking to myself, I'm trying to make it till tomorrow, buddy. <laughs> but I said, I'd like to be a judge. And he said, well, I will help you. That did not convince me to come. I went back to Durham and had made up my mind that I was gonna call him and decline the job offer, and Calvin Murphy called me, and uh, he said, um, I hear you're not going to take the job, and I said, nope, and he said, why? And he said, well, I don't want to prosecute my people. I don't want to send my people to jail, and he said, listen, and I don't know if you've ever talked to Calvin, but he has this deep <laughs> voice. <laughs> Very said, white. It's yeah. Very white yes. <laughs> <laughs> he said, listen, you have more power on that side of the house than you will ever have on that side. On the defense side. So, in other words, going to public defender's office, uh, trying to say you're going to keep people out of jail, you have much less power to do so. Right. And much less power with their fate if they end up going to less discretion. Uh-huh. Almost no discretion. It's the whole prosecutorial discretion. <laughs> uh, yeah. What do you charge? What That's do you right. Not charge? Who do you dismiss? Who do you punish? Yeah. So, after talking to Calvin, I decided to take the job and came to Charlotte. And, you know, as a black woman, you know, superior court judges travel different counties around the state. And during my tenure, we were traveling west for the most part. And I went as far as we, I could go and still be in the state of North Carolina. I could have lunch in Tennessee or South Carolina. One place in particular that I went, I was the only person of color in that little town. I must admit, I had a little bit of fear about going there because my colleagues had, well, one colleague in particular had spoken to me about it and told me that he never went there without a, a deputy sheriff along with him and helping him to, or following him as he drove down the mountain. So when I was assigned to go there, I, I thought about that and I called the clerk of court and to find out what kind of living accommodations because we would be there for at least a week if court lasted that long. What kind of living accommodations they had that I could rent a room and there was one hotel, motel in town that was not very uh, good and there was a Hardee's restaurant and a small grocery store. And she said, but my dad works for Duke Power and he goes to Charlotte on a weekly basis and comes back. And we have a cabin on the Nantahala Lake that you can stay in. 
And I said, well, let me call you back because I still wasn't convinced I wanted to stay there alone. And I called my court reporter who was going to, I knew her from other places, and told her that I had this offer and if she would stay with me, I would take it and we could stay in this uh, cabin on, together. And uh, that turned out to be the best experience because dad who worked for Duke Energy came home and he had a trout farm. So he made trout and slaw, he and his wife and the clerk who was his daughter and they invited the one probation officer in the county and the one state trooper and we had a wonderful time that fish. Yeah. Broke bread. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, just to have that change from my attitude going there and my attitude once I got there was a great difference. Yeah. So how long were you in the prosecutor's office? Five years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What was that experience like? Like, what's the biggest misconception about being a young prosecutor? What was the, like the big revelations that you had about the, the system, as they call it? Well, the system isn't always fair. Uh, still depends on who you are and um, sometimes the color of your skin. All of our judges had different ideas and thoughts about the way people should be treated. And sometimes you got harsher punishments because of who you are. So how did you make the decision to run for judge, to first run for judge, to first become a judge? Were you appointed or did you run? I was appointed to the district court bench first by Governor Martin. Oh, you yeah. were appointed by a Republican. Not because he wanted to. <laughs> oh, really? No, because um, the governor has to appoint someone from the same party of the person who's leaving. Oh. And it was a Democrat who was leaving. But he could have appointed other people. Yeah, he could have appointed other people. you were the people. least objectionable. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I don't think he liked me after that anyway. But um, I had a lot of support from a lot of people, including Peter Gilchrist. He probably led the way and encouraging. That was Peter a D, he a Democrat? Yeah. And it was, you know, that time because we didn't have any female, African American female on the bench in Charlotte. And then I got, I ran in an election for Superior Court. Superior were court. you the first? Yes. You were the very first? Yes. A state court, district court, any? Not district court. There were women on the district court, but oh. I was the first woman, African-American woman on the Superior Court oh, I in see. North Carolina. So did you run for district court before that? I mean, did you run? No. That okay. was the appointment by Governor Martin. And so how long were you on the district court bench? Two years. And what did you learn on the bench about your old job? Like all of a sudden when you're on the bench and you're looking at you across, <laughs> the, what did you learn about your old job when you got in the new one? I learned about myself that I was not going to do anything that I could not live with or I could not stand up and say, this is my decision. And if I felt or I found out that I made the wrong decision, I would change it. So when you get in that position of power and people are coming to you, um, how do you look at uh, a case, how do you 
temper justice with mercy, particularly when you're having to go in front of the voters again, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. how do you temper justice with mercy in a political environment? I wanted to treat people as fair as I could based on what I saw as fairness. And it didn't matter who you were or where you came from as long as I didn't treat you differently. And some people came before me who were in different situations because of their circumstances. You know, some kids would get into trouble. Um, had two kids that came before me, both charged with the same thing. One kid's parents had money, wealthy. They went out and bought him, not bought, but hired a best lawyer that he and went out and did a lot of things to present his uh, client. The other kid did not have any money, and he was appointed the public defender who has a Z in cases and don't have the time to go out and do all that illustrious things for that child. But I was determined that if the facts showed that they did the same thing, I was going to give them the same sentence. And I did. Probably didn't make, make the father spend uh, the all one who spent all the money <laughs> happy, but that was all right. That was fair in my mind. And, you know, if you take somebody's life, there has to be some punishment as a part of whatever sentence you get. And as a judge, that would bother me to not impose some sentence as a punishment. I had one case that came before me where the mother was, she would talk on the phone to men who was coming through town. And these were professional men who were traveling through Charlotte. And I don't know how she connected with them, but she would agree to prostitution with them. But instead of her prostituting, she put her 15-year-old daughter to meet these men. She pepped out her own daughter. Uh -huh. And she would pretend that she was the daughter on the phone. And the deal was the daughter was not going to talk to the men when she got with them. And she was arrested and charged with, um, I don't remember what the charge was. I felt very strongly about that, you know. I, I just felt that she deserved to serve some time in jail. It didn't matter how much. But she had violated a child like that, her own child. Yeah. And her lawyer, lawyer, and I really had it out about that because <laughs> he thought that I should just give her straight probation. And I told her, so, you know, if she wants to come in here and plead guilty, here's what I'll do. And I always told the lawyers during the plea conferences what the sentence would be if they pled guilty. And the facts were as they told me back in the conference room. And I told them if it facts turned out the way that you and the DA represented, this is the sentence I'll give her. It would be what we call a split sentence, where she get part probation and a short period of time in jail. And he became upset because he didn't think that was fair. So I told him that she didn't have to plead guilty before me because, you know, because it was a plea agreement they could reject the plea agreement and go somewhere else. So I told him he could go somewhere else. Shop for another job. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that... And what happened? He came and pled guilty because my reputation was that I was going to be fair. That's about the best he's going to get. Yeah, yeah. Rather than roll the dice. Well, that's right. <laughs> so he pled guilty. Uh, have you ever been threatened? No. I have not been threatened. Um, there were some times when someone escaped and 
the police would have a connection to my phone and they would um, watch my house and things like that. But I've never been threatened. I got along with people in the community and I would run into people who'd been in my courtroom and one, I remember I was in a grocery store once and this guy came up and he said, you're that judge, aren't you? And I said, um, yeah. And then he walked away and he came back to, <laughs> to me and said, I was in your courtroom. You don't remember me, do you? You know, it's hard to remember people, that, everybody that comes into your courtroom. And I said, well, I hope I treated you fairly. And he said, you did. Ah. I know. <laughs> How interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Is Charlotte getting any better with race relations? Is Charlotte becoming, or have we backslid? Uh, I think we've backslid some. You know, I remember when we created um, the community building initiative. I don't know if you remember that. What but, year? Mm, I don't remember what year, but it's the one that Diane English and has been running for about 20 years or more. And it was created by the city and the county because uh, a black man, no, a white man and a black woman had been shot by a police officer. And it was a big brouhaha about that. And, uh, city and county got involved and they created this commission to look at institutional racism was what they call it. So they have gone around and talked to the different institutions that's involved in the justice system and some that are not directly involved in the justice system. But you know, the thing that we don't talk about when we talk about racism and what we can do is economics. How do you level that playing field? Reverse redlining or... Yeah. Yeah. Schools, incentives, etc. But we are going backwards from that. Right. Mm -hmm. During the Black Lives Matter protest last year, during the pandemic, mm -hmm. um, did you ever go to any of the... No, protests? I didn't go to any of them. Because? Because I don't go out and protest like that. I support in other ways. What, what do you try to do? How do you try to... Education. I think that's important. I, I chair the Juneteenth Festival of the Carolinas, which is the largest one in the Southeast. And education is a big part of that. I think our kids need to learn their own history and um, celebrate our successes. And um, do a better job. Um, I think our parents need to become more involved in um, maybe mentoring. I'm a big mentoring fan, and I've done a program mentoring kids, and I, I just think that's very helpful. What is uh, Shirley Fulton's legacy? My legacy has been to make a difference in this community and the lives of the people that I've touched and to continue to do that. By doing what? By teaching. Teaching people. You know, and I, I think it's important not only for African Americans to know their history, but for Caucasians to know their history. And to have our lawmakers who don't want that kind of history taught is just repulsive. I don't think they should be serving. There's no such thing as 
we share this problematic history. We yeah. can't teach just one. Right. But that's what we've been doing. I've never heard of anything that African Americans did when I was coming up in school, learning history. We talked about Western civilization. Yeah, it's and I Western had an African American teacher who was teaching me that. Yeah. In some cases, it's required. Yeah, it was required. Yeah. Because the system said it was required. Well, I respect you so much, and I honor your service, and I thank you for your service to this community and to the, to the broader North Carolina and the nation. So well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for telling the stories. I am so appreciative of Judge Fulton's time. We met in the, her law offices. She's back practicing law. She's almost 70 years old. And one thing she's doing is expunging criminal records. She's doing some probate work, but she's also expunging criminal records. And she told me something she never realized in all her years on the bench is, you can't expunge a federal criminal record. There's something wrong about that. Um, there's something to that later on. But Shirley Fulton, thank you for your help and for your time. Man Listening is a production of Unmediated LLC in cooperation with the Queen City Podcast Network and Balto Creative Media. Allison Andrews at Andrews Creative and Rachel Clapp Miller are developmental producers. Sally Higgins at Higgins and Owens tries to keep us legal. Our music is A Day at the Park by the group Pictures of the Floating World. Your announcer is Katherine Smith. That's me. Please go to our Patreon page. You'll find us at patreon.com. Look for Man Listening, one word, no spaces. We hope you'll join us by becoming a member. A small investment can raise up the conversation. If you want exclusive member merch, like a t-shirt, we can arrange that too. A huge shout out and thank you to everyone who has supported Man Listening in whatever way you have supported us since the very beginning. Thanks so very much. Don't forget to support us at Patreon. We believe one voice can change the conversation. Click the subscribe button and next week you'll hear history we need because we need to know where we've come from, to know where we're going, and to one hopes, sometimes despairingly, that we won't repeat. That's next week on Man Listening. Thanks. <laughs>